Hello, and welcome to the session titled COVID-19, Clinical and Regulatory Considerations for Developing Treatment. My name is Beatrice Setnick, and I am the Chief Scientific Officer at Alta Sciences. Today, we will be discussing the development pathway for repurposing existing drug products for the treatment of COVID-19 to give our audience our perspective on the studies and timelines that are generally required for the development of such treatments. You may have heard about the already approved and marketed drugs that are currently being investigated to treat COVID-19, such as azithromycin, hydroxychloroquine, and remdesivir. We will review what is required to determine if such drugs are effective and safe for the treatment of COVID-19. This session is brought to you by Alta Sciences. Alta Sciences is a forward-thinking CRO offering a flexible approach to preclinical and clinical pharmacological studies, including formulation, manufacturing, and analytical services. Alta Sciences full service solutions covers the various phases of early drug development, including drug manufacturing, preclinical, clinical, regulatory, and bioanalytical services. I would now like to introduce you to my colleague, Marie Eve Cabana, Associate Director of Marketing Services, who will be leading our interview today, and Paul Sidney, Senior Director of Compliance and Regulatory Affairs, who will be providing input for regulatory considerations. Over to you, Mary Eve. So my first question is for Paul. What steps are regulatory agencies taking or putting in place in order to help the fight against the coronavirus? Well, as you can imagine, um, this is a, a big, big event in the world globally, and uh, the regulatory authorities are prioritizing their support to the industry to facilitate the availability of uh, all forms of medical products, diagnostic kits, medical devices, therapeutics. Uh, we'll be focusing, Beatrice and I will be focusing on the uh, COVID-19 therapies to uh, address the pandemic. Um, and I think the overarching relationship with the healthcare industry uh, and the government is one of partnership and collaboration. You can see that uh, demonstrated um, through the fact that they have dedicated resources to coordinate the direct support to the industry at all stages through the product uh, therapy development. Uh, and internationally, they're um, actually collaborating amongst themselves, the health authorities, uh, maintaining frequent and timely updates. As this pandemic uh, progresses, uh, there are new thoughts and new insights. And so guidance documents are being published on a regular basis, letters to industry, webinars, uh, product-specific correspondence. Uh, so quite a comprehensive uh, support to the industry and to, to the world uh, in, in uh, fighting this pandemic. Uh, the regulatory guidance provides the industry, uh, that's been provided to the industry, is actually coordinated through two main groups uh, internationally. Uh, one we all are uh, well aware of, which is the World Health Organization. Uh, the other is the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities, uh, ICMRA. Uh, the ICMRA representatives have provided uh, harmonized guidance for the development of vaccine therapies, uh, and in doing, in doing so has assured that all uh, the authorities around the world are, are working in harmony uh, to accelerate uh, the development of uh, new therapies. Participants have uh, shared uh, various accelerated measure, measures, and that's in fact what Beatrice and I will be discussing in greater detail, uh, primarily to uh, address um, some of the challenges of running clinical trials and preclinical uh, assessments and designing uh, common study protocols. Um, they've highlighted opportunities to evaluate investigational agents uh, or repurposed medicines. Uh, and that's something that we'll, we'll delve deeper uh, into uh, later in the discussion, uh, specifically uh, to uh, take advantage of a regulation that's been promulgated years back through the FDA, uh, the 505B2 NDA approval process. This uh, allows uh, companies to repurpose 
uh, existing therapies uh, for new indications. And Beatrice will provide some examples that have already demonstrated some level of success. And I'm sure some folks have already uh, seen this within the press. Um, in addition, there's uh, processes that are in place uh, in, uh, that have been put into place through the uh, emergency use authorization process. That's something that has uh, been in place with the FDA and they're uh, springboarding that process as well. So not only existing uh, drug development processes, but also emergency use authorization processes to further expedite the process. Um, to, to continue on this, uh, mindset. There's uh, evolving knowledge as well. Uh, and so to make sure that globally everyone is working in concert, uh, there are bi-weekly meetings uh, hosted by the ICMA uh, representatives. And just to give you a sense of how important this is uh, for all agencies, in fact, one of the um, meetings was hosted by the director of CEDAR, uh, Dr. Janet Woodcock, uh, who oversaw uh, the specifics of that um, that conference, one of the conferences. So overall, I think I think the take-home message that I'm trying to share is that there's an urgency, there's resources being uh, marshaled to make sure that drug development is moving at the the most expedient manner, uh, and that it's coordinated. Uh, with all of the agencies and that they're partnering with industry. Okay, well, you, you're mentioning expediency, uh, which could bring me into my next question. So what, um, how is the FDA and Health Canada facilitating expedient uh, development of coronavirus therapies? Well, um, as I led into the overall uh, approach globally and, and some of the highlighted elements with the FDA, there are many guidances that are being published and specific notifications that are being published. Um, we've maintained uh, those lists internally at Alta Sciences to support our clinical trial programs. And I'm sure uh, if anybody wishes uh, to access them, uh, we'd be more than happy to share those uh, with you. Um, but you can also obviously go to the uh, websites that are hosting and promulgating these uh, information uh, guidance documents on a, on a furious pace, actually. There's uh, almost daily, there's something new that's out there that's helping uh, industry push things forward. In the case of Health Canada, uh, there's been a, a notice that's been published specifically by the uh, therapeutics uh, group uh, committing to expedite the review of COVID-19 therapies, uh, submissions, applications, and the review of these applications. Uh, in addition, there's a, a tool that the uh, Canadian government has under health, the health ministry called the interim order, and they have um, issued an interim order that specifically um, expedites the uh, approval, review, and interim approval uh, for emergency use of in vitro diagnostics, such as serological and nucleic acid kits, which I'm sure you've seen in the press. Uh, the new drug submission approval process in the Food and Drug Act uh, is also uh, as I shared with you through the 505B2, supporting uh, an expedited uh, process. Some of the other uh, FDA uh, tools that are uh, being uh, accessed include regular updates, as I said, on websites, uh, uh, de developing guidance to specifically for COVID-19 uh, development, and various webinars as well uh, that they're they're promulgating uh, and giving more deep information. There's also daily roundups, which gives a sense of what I was trying to share and the fact that 
there are regular updates to support the industry. It's not simply one guidance and it's left static. Uh, as we can see uh, in the press, it's an evolving um, aspect of learning more about the, the pandemic and the disease. And therefore, there is a need for flexibility in these guidances. And the daily roundup briefings provide that kind of timely, immediate information. Um, one of the more uh, telling guidances that's proved to be very helpful for those that are conducting clinical trials is one that's been published in April 16th, 2020. Uh, the title of that is uh, Conducting Clinical Trials During the COVID-19 Public Health Emergency. Um, it's, there, it's been presented in a webinar fashion as well to further instance um, the information that's been uh, documented in that, in that guidance document. Um, and some of the key elements in that document that are worth taking note is um, basically how to manage the recruitment uh, in, in the time of this pandemic, the challenges that are associated with that, uh, accessing investigational product. As you can see, there's been challenges with supply chain, and so they've offered um, mitigation and management approaches uh, should there be any uh, investigational product supply chain issues. Uh, they've also provided some guidance on how to manage protocol deviations and amendments uh, should there be uh, any challenges uh, due to the fact of social distancing or um, the, the protocols that have been put in place to um, manage the, the uh, propagation of, of the COVID virus um, and how that may impact on a clinical trial. They've also talked about uh, virtual clinical trial visits, uh, self-administration of IP, uh, the investigational product at home. Uh, so that's uh, a very good um, guidance document. And on-site monitoring of clinical trials, uh, what their expectations are. They're exploring the idea of remote um, monitoring, which is uh, something that's been talked about uh, and is actually been detailed in this guidance uh, to help uh, proper management and collection of meaningful clinical trial uh, data. Um, so you can see that the, the flexibility and how the government is addressing the challenges of the pandemic um, and managing a effective clinical trial has been clearly delineated in the guidance document and, and provides some very helpful um, roadmap on, on how to, to uh, manage a clinical trial. Um, in fact, just to give you a sense of the prolific nature of the FDA, there's almost 40 guidance documents they've published to date, over 40 documents that have been published to date, uh, which just gives you a sense of um, you know, how busy and how collaborative and proactive, and, and also the, the amount of resource that they've dedicated to this uh, important issue. There are other uh, key programs, and I, I can get uh, more directly, uh, I provide more detail on those. One of them is called uh, the CTAP program, uh, and still uh, another one that's specifically an offshoot of the uh, international group that I was talking about, the ICMRA, uh, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. That one's um, addressing how to best develop vaccine therapies and how to um, implement various um, guidance suggestions to expedite vaccine therapy development. What is uh, the CTAP program? Um, yeah, sorry, I sort of led right into it. <laughs> that program is, it's, it's actually an acronym. It's, uh, it stands uh, for Coronavirus Treatment Acceleration Program. Sounds uh, very fancy, but I think that's why they stuck with the, uh, the acronym. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, you'll see that, you know, the, the recurring terms here is fast track, acceleration, expedient, uh, emergency use, it's, it's all, uh, you know, paving a path 
to make sure that uh, the therapies, uh, both treatment and preventative, are, are facilitated, not only in the development and design of, of the trials, uh, but also um, you know, for the approval of, of the products as well. So some of the details on the CTAP, um, just to highlight, uh, when they drafted this, there was in the order of around 70, 72 active trials uh, and 200 development uh, programs for therapeutic agents, all for COVID-19. So the industry hasn't been uh, caught sleeping either. They're, they're actively developing products at, at a rate of knots. Mm -hmm. um, the process that, that was developed um, is a, a very well thought through um, management approach. And uh, the first stage in the CTAP program is a triage. And essentially what that is, is uh, it, the developer's requests Requests are forwarded on to a specific uh, FDA staff member whose specialty would be in that particular therapy uh, or treatment uh, modality for, for the disease, if it's uh, a treatment rather than prevention, obviously. And then once that reviewer has gone through the documents, they're actually a resource for that uh, company to uh, refine their program and they will have dialogues right up front. There's not the formal aspects to some respect of uh, pre-IND meetings and so on. It's much more iterative and immediate. In fact, the second stage, just by its name, um, gives you a clear understanding of uh, the speed. They call it ultra rapid input. <laughs> uh, that's out of the guidance, that's not me. <laughs> Uh, and essentially what that uh, process is, is to review uh, the prioritized um, uh, therapies that have come into uh, the agency. Uh, they uh, assess the scientific merit, uh, and then they will um, push that forward if it has uh, obvious and clear scientific merit uh, for uh, progress and they will offer to review uh, the protocol associated with that um, drug within a 24 hour submission timeframe, which is extraordinary, which gives you a clear example of the commitment and resource they've uh, allocated. Uh, a complete review of a single patient is also being um, offered as well if it's a, a compassionate, um, administration of the product and they will review the results of that therapy within a three-hour time frame. Uh, they committed, as you can see by virtue of me walking through some of these uh, initiatives, uh, that they're working very closely uh, with the applicants um, all uh, throughout the whole process uh, to, to assure that the quality uh, component the safety and efficacy component are all appropriate. And in fact, they will even assist if there's any, any limited um, problems of manufacturing to transfer the manufacturing to another site, uh, which is once again, still another example of, of their commitment. So currently there's, uh, as of, well, I shouldn't say currently, as of April 16th, they have in the order of 950 in inquiries. I'm sure that's even um, a greater number at, at the date that we're presenting right now. Wow. Uh, so that, that gives you a sense of it. I, I would just like to close that that's the CTAP program. Uh, the EMEA um, also has something that actually was just published yesterday. Uh, so it just gives you a sense of what I was sharing that it's just happening on a regular basis uh, as of uh, a day before this uh, particular webinar was uh, recorded uh, they've developed something called the fast track program which is almost identical to the fda program uh, so i won't go in detail on that but it also demonstrates uh, the, the fact that it's so similar to the fda it also demonstrates the fact that the ICMA group that I was talking about where there's global sharing 
uh, is really um, getting traction because they, they obviously are sharing their ideas. Uh, some of the maybe unique aspects of the EMA uh, uh, review process is they introduce something called a rolling review, which is essentially to look at the data as a trial progresses rather than waiting for a, a one done and submit. Uh, essentially, uh, this rolling review uh, will collect data as the trials progress and they commit to a two-week two turnaround so that there's a, a development of knowledge going forward. And they anticipate with that methodology to dramatically decrease the uh, time of approval onto market. Um, so all of this is really exciting stuff. And I, I know I was sort of, you know, tabling all this stuff in a very uh, methodical way, but I think it's, it's, in my opinion, useful information, and, and it's just really giving a, a roadmap for folks to go on to the various websites and keep hunting uh, for these guidance documents um, and just be heartened to the fact that um, you know, it is truly hand in hand working to, to find a therapy, uh, both uh, private and, and government. Mm -hmm. Um, so my next question would be uh, for Beatrice. So we're seeing, um, you know, everybody joining in against uh, coronavirus and finding a treatment, and we're seeing a lot of um, companies repurposing drugs. So it would be it would be good, I think, to know what the required studies are in order to uh, gain approval for a repurposed drug. Mm -hmm. So when you're repurposing a drug, you're taking a drug that's already marketed, but being used for another therapy or another reason or purpose or target indication, as they call it, and you're reusing it or try testing it out in a new condition. In this case, it would be COVID-19. Now, in this situation, because the drug is already marketed and approved, the regulatory agencies, the, the pharmaceutical company or whoever has submitted the information for approval for the drug has already conducted much of the experimentation. So this allows for a certain degree of fast tracking for in terms of the numbers of studies that are required. So usually you'll do a comparative study of your new formulation of the drug compared to the existing marketed formulation to see if the, the release is similar. Um, and the number of studies will really depend on the data that's available for the marketed drug. So for example, for COVID-19, you'll be, the drug will be potentially used in various age, age groups, uh, various population types, uh, some patients that may already have pre-existing conditions. Uh, and in some cases, data, safety data may not exist in those populations. Uh, so it has to be carefully reviewed to see where there may be some data gaps in terms of safety. Now, certainly when you are repurposing a drug for a new therapy like COVID-19, you would need to do efficacy studies to show that it is effective in the treatment of COVID-19, in which case these are called uh, phase two, phase three trials. Uh, so you would probably test in a smaller number of group of patients to pressure test to see if the uh, drug is effective. And if so, you would move into a larger phase three trials. And you typically you require two efficacy studies to establish data for sufficient to establish that there are is an effective therapy on hand. Uh, so these are usually trials that are uh, in patient, requiring patients in the several hundreds to thousands. And uh, the time for that development work probably is about realistically easily two to three years because the phase three patient trials, uh, because of the volume of patients that you need to test, take a little bit longer. So you're looking at the time that you need to take to initiate the study, to the collection of data, uh, so then you submit your data and then have um, regulatory approval before it can hit the market. Uh, and that in itself is takes a few, several months, uh, but now under the pandemic, regulatory agencies are expediting and fast-tracking reviews for potential COVID-19. So this helps to shorten the timeline, uh, but it realistically can take um, up to, even up to several years to get something move through that kind of program, depending on how quickly the recruitment of patients are and how quickly those phase three efficacy studies can go. And um, these drugs are approved drugs already when we're repurposing them? 
yes. And they do require uh, further testing because they, we, although we know the safety, we're not sure, depending on the type of drug it is, for example, the existing marketed drug may not have, for example, safety data in children, for example. So you may need to do a test in children to see if it's safe and at what doses you would need to do. So if a, a drug is treating a different type of an infection or a different type of virus, you may actually need to adjust the doses that, you, you, that are effective for treating COVID. And when, when you do that, they either may be much higher than what's tested or they may be lower. But if they go higher, then you need to do some additional safety testing. You may have to look at different populations. Uh, but just because a drug is approved and marketed doesn't mean that it's safe and effective for different indications. And so you have to be very careful because oftentimes drugs can have different interactions with other drugs. Uh, they may be contraindicated for other conditions, or they may have safety concerns for vulnerable populations, like, for example, for someone who has um, some cardiac issues or hepatic or renal impairment. Uh, so whatever safety data isn't sufficient for that treatment of the new target, in this case, COVID-19, that would require further testing, even though they may be already marketed drugs. So there's always, there may be potential important safety data that's missing. And certainly we need to know if these drugs are effective. You don't want to impose or bring out drugs that may potentially be harmful in certain populations or that don't work well for COVID-19 because it would give, um, you know, it would, if it's not effective, then people aren't getting the treatment and they may be getting side effects. So you certainly don't want situations like that. You want to bring on drugs on board that are, you can test and know with reasonable certainty that they will be effective in the condition that you're trying to treat. Okay. And would it be, um, I guess it would be important to know the application process uh, between 505B2 and generic uh, drugs? Yeah, so many people get the two confused oftentimes if they're not familiar with the regulatory process. So a generic application is also an application for an already marketed drug. But in the case of a generic application, you're essentially creating a copy of an existing drug and you're using it for the same purposes. So, for example, uh, if you have a drug to treat pain, you would create a generic drug to, to treat pain at, the, at virtually the same doses. So in those cases, those are very um, easy relatively straightforward applications because you're really just making sure that your drug is released in the same way that the marketed drug is. It has the same bioequivalency, as they call it, mm -hmm. uh, but you're not using it for a different indication. When you have a 505B2 application, you can take, it's when you take an existing marketing drug, but you're doing something different to it. You may be turning it into an extended release formulation. You may be changing the formulation. You may be changing the route of administration. You may be changing the target population. So you're doing something different that requires a, a bit more evaluation from either a, a safety and an efficacy perspective. So it, um, it is a little bit more involved, but it's certainly a lot faster than if you were to take uh, go from the beginning of drug discovery. So if you're going if you're going to do de novo research for a new, brand new drug to, to treat COVID-19, generally novel pathways require about 10 years, uh, just to give you a frame of reference, mm -hmm. uh, because you virtually have to test at all different aspects. You need preclinical data to ensure that it's safe before you can go into human trials, and then you need extensive uh, clinical trials in various populations at various doses to establish the safety of the drug. So those are the very longest um, new chemical entity applications. So certainly with these, with repurposing existing drugs, it allows for a expedited application from the for, from the forefront because of the ability to support it with the comparator drug that's already marketed. Yeah, as Beatrice is saying, I mean that that uh, you know you have all this published safety data that is available and that is likely in some cases still valid. Uh, there may be areas where you would have to uh, amplify that information depending on its intended indication, but, but there is background safety data, uh, core data, and so that would really cut into uh, the development mm -hmm. time. So it's a, it's a really um, great, a way of expediting the process. Exactly, and certainly when there's uh, sorry when there's published data on a drug, 
even if a, a marketed drug is not filed in a certain country. So for example, COVID-19 is a, is a global pandemic. Uh, so it would benefit if a, if a new therapy came out, it would be beneficial for global use. Uh, other countries can rely on data that's been collected, even if a drug hasn't been approved, if there are publications and other data sources to help support the, the regulatory submissions in other countries. And I'm sure, uh, and Paul may be able to comment on the kind of the more of the global efforts of how people may synchronize uh, consistent drug approvals of, in different countries if a promising therapy for COVID-19 emerges. I'm sure there'll be a lot of co collaborations between our regulatory agencies across the globe to bring those to the forefront for, for use in their, in their respective countries. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's uh, exactly the purpose of that ICMRA group and the regulatory authorities are actually tracking all the therapies um, in real time and they're actually using existing, uh, for instance, some trials are using real world evidence uh, data trials mm -hmm. and, and they're accessing the database and all uh, the health authorities are monitoring it and I, I'm quite confident or discussing it real time, as you can see by the uh, very mm -hmm. proactive nature uh, of some of the agencies that within their own country. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's important that we also go into um, a little bit more detailed timelines um, regarding these um, repurposing of drugs. So I'm wondering if we can go in a little more detail about that. Um, so what mm -hmm. would you be able to elaborate a little on the estimated time frame uh, for this type of testing? Mm -hmm. Well, I, like I mentioned, if, if you're doing a, a drug de novo, it could take uh, well into a decade, if not longer, if you're developing a brand new chemical that's not been tested or marketed. Uh, so those are the long, longest periods of time required for drug approval. But when you're taking an existing marketed drug, there will be a handful of studies that can that will need to be conducted. Uh, for example, you'll need to compare it to the existing formulation. Uh, so your new formulation that you're developing, uh, you'll you'll probably do some kind of a bioequivalency to make sure that your formulation is releasing the way it's supposed to, uh, that the drug is released and, and results in the same uh, blood concentrations of that drug. You would also have to take a look at the existing safety information, and this will this will vary from drug to drug. So, for example, like I, I gave an earlier example, if, for example, uh, we know that a lot of uh, elderly patients are affected by COVID-19. So, for example, if a, a drug hadn't been thoroughly tested in the elderly population, it may require additional uh, preliminary work just to make sure that it's safe in that population before you started to go into very large trials in involving elderly patients. Uh, so, first, you have to see what the drug is being intended for. In the case of COVID-19, because it's, it's such a widespread uh, dr uh, virus that really affects all ages uh, and demographics, you need to consider that for safety. And so I think the, the initial thing would be to do a data gap analysis to see if there are additional uh, preliminary trials, phase one trials that usually take about 20 to 30 patients, it can be upwards of 60 patients, but these would look at any special populations that you'd have to look at safety, uh, which may or may not be needed depending on the drug. Uh, but what would be needed, uh, you, you need to take a look at the dosing. So you need to characterize, and this is usually done in, phase, in a phase two trial, these are smaller patient studies where you're now taking, uh, it could be anywhere up to uh, approximately 80 to uh, a few hundred patients and you're testing different doses to see what dose is responsive in COVID-19. And if you're looking, and these are usually preliminary studies which will tell you, is there a signal to show that the drug is working in this condition? And if so, what doses do you need to explore? And the doses could be variable because people have different metabolism, they have different body weights, so there's oftentimes an adjustment needed, uh, but this allows you to gauge what may be um, effective in the co for the, the treatment of COVID-19. Uh, and then once you have your sort of doses configured and safety in that population established, some preliminary looks at uh, showing efficacy, uh, you, roll that, you can roll that into uh, a phase three trial. So when you're trying to expedite it, you may have a preliminary stage where you look at that and then you continue into a larger trial. So there's a way of expediting these, even these clinical studies so that you're not having to start and restart new trials, but rather get um, a very creative in, in terms of combining trials to reduce timelines. But essentially, efficacy requires 
some time to do because these are large trials. They're typically several hundred, sometimes even into the thousands of patients. If you need enough patients to be able to support a endpoint showing that it's effective for the condition being treated. Now, with agencies typically in drug development, they're usually, they ask for two efficacy studies. When you have pandemics like this, they may, a single study may be sufficient. So it really depends on how they, the regulatory agents respond. Uh, but I would estimate realistically, it could take about two to three years to bring something to market, potentially sooner if they have a lot of already really good safety data for a, for a given marketed drug. Um, but it does take some time to get a hundred, several hundreds of patients into a trial, enrolled, tested, and have an appropriate follow-up period to make sure that, for example, the COVID-19 has resolved and that the drug was effective. So you have, you have to treat. Uh, usually these types of treatments will be acute treatment while they're perhaps in a hospital setting. Uh, but then you do need some time for follow-up to make sure that the symptoms have appropriate re resolved and what the long-term side effects, if any, may be of a drug. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, it does take time. It really de will depend on the type of drug as well and, and the safety profile of the drug. Uh, so I estimate, you know, there have been um, optimistic views that we may be able to get something within about a year, uh, but I think the, the reality is it may take longer. And you have to also remember that uh, because a drug is being brought into a clinical trial doesn't mean it's going to be successful. As we know, as drug developers working on clinical trials all the time, uh, unfortunately, many of them uh, are not effective or there are other issues that uh, eventually uh, wean them out of the drug development process. So uh, we're certainly optimistic for therapies, but it may take time and it may take time before a, an effective, a safe and effective medication is approved. And would you say that it's the same process if we're looking at uh, com combining drugs in terms of a treatment? It is. It's the same. It's the same idea because currently there there are no COVID nineteen therapies. So anything you're trying with existing drugs, whether you're looking at a single drug or whether you're looking at combining them, uh, you still need to look at whether that combination is safe and effective in treatment. It's a little bit more complex when you're combining drugs because then you have an increased um, chance of uh, interaction with other drugs that patients may be on. So you may have other safety concerns to think about, um, especially if those drugs have not been combined before. Uh, so there actually may be more safety data required in such cases, depending on whether or not those drugs are normally given together or not. Uh, so that, but it's the same uh, approach. You would still mm -hmm. need to establish the safety and to show that it is effective in, in treatment of COVID-19. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, Beatrice has articulated really well, and I basically the science is the science. You know, what I've provided you is how the government is doing everything they can to, I guess, for want of a better term, uh, decrease the white space, the administrative white space sometimes, you know, with between waiting for an answer and, and you know, finalizing the design of a protocol and, and gaining actually knowledge from, from the government because they may have an insight on that therapy uh, that could be shared with the industry. So that, that kind of uh, acceleration is there, but at the end of the day, uh, a clinical trial is there to, to ensure the, you know, the safety uh, of um, population that's received the medication then in fact it truly is efficacious mm -hmm. so you mm -hmm. you have to follow science you know exactly and um i get my next question could be for paul so we have um at alta sciences we have clinical sites uh in the united states as well as in canada so i'm wondering if there would be any specific considerations um for running these trials in either the u.s or in canada well, I, I mean, generally, just in, in broad terms, I, I thought through, um, you know, your question, and I'm thinking, uh, honestly, in the COVID-19 uh, space, and that's what we're focusing this on, uh, um, there isn't um, much difference between, because it is a global effort, uh, there is guidances out there that are shared, uh, and I, I just to reiterate what I had commented on earlier, I think some of the main things is dealing with how you manage trial recruitment, uh, managing IP supply, patient monitoring, uh, 
you know, um, alternate methods for, for safety assessments, um, if, if need be, if there's visit, um, site visit problems um, and challenges because of the pandemic, uh, screening challenges, uh, you know, interaction with the IRB um, should be proactive uh, and, and changes are prioritized within your, your IRB for these COVID therapies. Um, but all of this is underlined within the guidance and you know, I think if you follow the GCPs, you document what you're doing, and you you mm -hmm. keep current with the guidances that are published, I think you'll be fine in in uh, in either either country and run, running these COVID uh, 505 studies. And with mm -hmm. the, um, I'm sorry, Beatrice, did you have something to add? No, I, I echo uh, Paul's comments. I mean, both U.S. and Canada have conduct studies under ICH guidelines. The, uh, usually when you have phase three studies, it probably would be of interest to go beyond just a single country and diversify it because this any kind of treatment for COVID-19 really will be meant for global use right. uh, because of the, the global nature of the pandemic and ensuring that you have a diversity represented in the clinical trials is going to be important. Uh, different uh, ethnicities, races, uh, gender, uh, age ranges, all of that's very important. And oftentimes that's accomplished if you, uh, most phase three type trials oftentimes are multi-country trials because they want to consider the different genetic variant variations across our global population. Exactly, right. Thank you. And uh, so looking at the global aspect then, if my coronavirus therapy does qualify for a 505B2 uh, submission, can foreign data be used uh, towards this submission? Yes, actually, and, and that's uh, built directly into uh, U.S. law, actually. Um, I'll just do my regulatory thing here. I'll cite a, a regulation. The, the uh, Part 312.120 actually stipulates uh, that uh, foreign uh, study data can be used uh, to support uh, a market application. And in fact, it, it, these studies uh, can be uh, developed outside and supporting the, the definitive application uh, without an IND uh, approval within the U.S. They, they will accept uh, clinical trials and the safety and efficacy data that's been developed uh, from uh, foreign institutions and foreign uh, clinical trials uh, and to support a market authorization. And that's also stipulated within the regulations 314.106. Um, essentially, the key to this is that you follow ICH guidance uh, which is international standard. You follow the good clinical practice uh, approach, which is international standard. And uh, in fact, it, it will be um, accepted by the uh, FDA. So Beatrice, my next question, um, can repurposed drugs be used off-label? Uh, yes, yeah, so I mean, there, there is certainly a, a degree of off-label use that's used in, in clinical practice, and, and sometimes it's medically guided. So if, uh, if a disease or something life-threatening may be required for treatment, oftentimes uh, doctors will make medical judgment to see if, if an existing therapy that may not necessarily be indicated will be effective. Um, so that can be used under medical emergencies. Uh, generally, off-label use for a wider spread um, condition where you're trying to claim it to be effective in a condition has to be studied. And it's reasonable that that's the case because anything that's going to be used on such a wide scale and, and thinking about COVID-19, how many millions are affected by it, uh, just going off and allowing free range off-label use could be very dangerous because we may not know what the repercussions would be from a safety standpoint in, in a large scale of, of subjects and whether or not it would be effective. So certainly you don't want to uh, give a drug uh, and then perhaps not try an alternate therapy that may have been more effective or another course of, of 
medication or introduce some kind of side effect that may worsen the condition than actually help it. So it's um, while there can be off-label use for something that you, you require to determine if something is, is effective for a indication or a, a problem like COVID-19, it really does need testing. And the testing is there for everyone's safety and, and benefit. So it is, um, and that's all the whole reason why we have drug approvals is to protect the public, uh, to ensure that what they're getting is safe and works. And um, Paul, is there an advantage? So our head office here at Alta Sciences is in Canada. So I'm wondering if there is an advantage um, to running the trial in Canada uh, against the 505B2 submission. Uh, yeah, I, I, there is in, in some respects because the uh, CTA process is um, uh, unlike the IND, which is uh, an IND process is developed uh, to provide safety and efficacy for the complete uh, preclinical pro uh, the clinical program, the phase one, two, and three, multiple uh, clinical trials, whereas the CTA process is is developed per clinical trial submission. Uh, and so what that offers is, um, you know, a, a smaller a burden as far as developing uh, safety um, data for, for a given phase of the trial. You're, you're trying to uh, develop a knowledge of the safety within a narrower scope. Uh, and that, that facilitates, uh, in fact, a flexibility in the development uh, of the drug. Uh, you, and the timing of the studies. Uh, it, it also is a little less burdensome because you're focusing your feedback on that given trial, uh, whereas in an IND situation, you're, you're having to provide regular updates for all the ongoing clinical trials. So in, in some respects, there, there is um, you know, that, that advantage or flexibility and, and speed of, of moving forward into uh, first and human. Uh, I think also, um, as I've mentioned, you know, the FDA does accept the trials of foreign uh, studies and uh, Health Canada is certainly one that works collaboratively with the FDA. It has a strong international relationship globally. Uh, it works and is an active member in ICH and the PIC group. Um, and has various formal uh, information uh, sharing with all the main agencies, both EMA, FDA, and so on. So uh, that um, approach and, and what's expected of Health Canada would be consistent with what the FDA uh, would want, but in a more flexible and uh, specific manner. The, the timing uh, of approval of a CTA is similar to the IND, so you're not uh, decreasing uh, the flexibility there. You'll, you'll file and, and get a 30-day uh, approval time frame committed by the agency, Health Canada. Uh, and there's, there's a long history of, of working with uh, health professionals, institutions, and in fact, um, there are thousands of trials run in Canada. So I think there is, a, um, you know, to some extent, an advantage. Uh, and um, we mentioned, uh, Paul, you mentioned ICMRA at the, the beginning of our um, discussion today. So I was wondering if we can just go back to that and see how is ICMRA facilitating vaccine therapy development? Yeah, so that that's uh, one of the first uh, publications they made uh, with respect to uh, supporting the industry. It was published March 18th, 2020, uh, and uh, FDA and EMA um, drafted minutes of the global uh, meeting and essentially provided uh, a guidance to the industry of to the data requirements for developing a vaccine therapy. Um, essentially uh, looking at uh, vaccine therapies, not unlike, um, you know, what we were describing 
with the 505b2 in the fact that you're looking for commonality uh, of, of existing vaccines. Um, so they're looking to see and, and have presented it in the guidance that if the construct and the manufacturing process and methodology is comparable, they're proposing that you would be able to access some of the existing preclinical safety data for other vaccines to map uh, against uh, developing vaccines. And they'll obviously look at that with the industry, confirm its similarity, uh, that it is a well-characterized vaccine, that it clearly maps against an existing one, and then it, you may be able to uh, diminish the amount of preclinical work uh, that, that you have to do to bring it into the uh, clinical uh, trial aspect. So uh, I think that's one of the biggest um, take-homes from the ECMRA and, and the vaccine therapies and how they're pushing um, previous knowledge to, to drive forward, previous safety knowledge to drive forward clinical uh, assessment. Mm -hmm. And for vaccines, certainly safety becomes a very important issue because vaccines are intended for an otherwise healthy population to prevent uh, COVID-19 infection. Whereas uh, what we were talking about earlier, the therapies are intended for the patients that already have COVID-19. So uh, when you're looking at a vaccine, knowing that you'd be giving it to otherwise healthy children and vulnerable populations that, are, um, that may not have COVID-19, uh, you know, there, there are safety considerations that have to be carefully uh, managed to ensure that you have something that works well and is safe. And to close off our discussion today, I was wondering if uh, you would have any final thoughts uh, for our listeners um, today. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, what I would like to say is that I hope sincerely that we have some additional treatments to put into our toolbox for the fight against COVID-19 soon. And although I know that um, first and foremost, speed is, is of utter, uh, utmost importance, the importance of safety and efficacy are even more so important because we, we need to understand and fully take accountability for whatever is brought to market for treatment of COVID-19. And it is no art to bring in something that will cause further problems or safety issues. So it is, there are many, many great minds across the world working on the solutions for COVID-19. And while it is uh, integral to get these out quickly to mitigate the uh, potential downside of COVID-19 and the health effects it has on people globally, uh, I'm sure that uh, with time and with diligent scientific research, um, although expedited and perhaps um, creatively done in ways to shorten the timelines, the integrity of the science has to be there. And I know that uh, our, our company has been uh, involved in, in some aspects. And I know that there are a lot of very talented researchers out there uh, globally putting their heads together to, to come up with it for vaccines. So I wish that uh, everyone stay safe. And I hope that we all ride through this uh, pandemic as safely as possible and have vaccines and medications that are not only developed for COVID-19, but that can help us in the future to prevent such pandemics from occurring in the first place, because it's uh, not only mitigating this one, but hopefully preventing future ones. Yeah, I can't, I can't add anything more. Thank you, Beatrice, is well put. I just <laughs> echo everything you've said and, and to just say that um, it's really heartening to, to see, um, you know, the partnership and collaboration throughout um, across the world and, and uh, the fight against this pandemic. So um, I, I concur with Beatrice. And I'd like to thank you, Beatrice and Paul, for your time today. Um, this very interesting conversation about COVID-19 clinical and regulatory considerations mm -hmm. for developing treatments. And thank you to our listeners um, to this uh, discussion today. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.